I think I'd like to start with a, an observation that I've seen made time and time again during my 37-year career. It is this, and that is that experts are terribly bad at predicting the future. I'm sure it was um, her usual Iron Lady self, Lady Margaret Thatcher, when she predicted 1969. No woman in my time will be prime minister. And who could doubt Ken Oslin when he said eight years later, there is no reason for any individual to have a computer in their house. After all, he was the inventor of the mini computer. From social to technology change, we've always seen and underestimate the speed of development. But as a businessman and a banker, I think the most dramatic revolution is now evolving. And the West, I would argue, has miscalculated the rapid rise of the world's emerging markets. When you are the group CEO of the world's largest international bank, it is my duty not just to read reports, but to visit our operations in 85 different countries. And I would say that I spend about four months of the year on the road. I visited around 40 countries this year on six continents. And I've become more and more certain the world's economy is changing faster than ever and far quicker than people understand. In May this year, I was in um, Venice. And I thought to myself when I gave a speech there and my wife who hasn't, doesn't travel with me very often and convinced me that I should spend at least an hour looking at Venice. And she took me around these beautiful canals. I thought to myself, wasn't Venice the center of the world's Venetian bankers in the 16th century? And today it's just a water attraction. Today's world economic gravity is unmistakably sh shifting again. And this time, it's moving east and south. The financial crisis has only accelerated things, and the G20 has come of age. Could what has happened to Venice, could it happen to other financial centers around the world in the coming years? Today, I would like to take you through a tour of the world and basically looking at the emerging markets, because I firmly believe that only an understanding of what is happening can we ensure that the West does not get left behind. As HSBC's first group chief executive to be based in Hong Kong for 17 years, it seems right that I should start in Asia. So first of all, let's look at China, the home of tomorrow's largest middle class. Most now agree this will be China's century. We expect China's total trade flows with the rest of the world to grow by some 13% a year over the next five years to five trillion dollars. And I believe the renminbi will become one of the world's top three trading currencies much sooner than ever was anticipated. Even less well understood is the speed with which China is transforming itself from export to retail markets. Here are a few of the facts. China has 17, 717 cities with over half a million people. Over the next five years, its middle class is expected to almost double, from 172 million people to 314 million people. Already, consumer behavior is changing. The Chinese bought more cars than the Americans in 2009. And in the first half of this year, BMW sold more cars in China than it did in the UK. It goes without saying that many Western businessmen are putting China at the heart of their strategy. But I'm not sure they are moving deep enough and fast enough beyond the gateways of Beijing and Shanghai. China's wealth is becoming increasingly diverse and dispersed. One of the things I noticed on my return to Hong Kong is the blue sky. That doesn't come from the lifting of smog in Hong Kong but in the movement of factories out of the southern region into the hinterland to the interland. And the production and the infrastructure and the development is moving across all of China. Within the financial sector, things are changing. Shenzhen is a city of more than 10 million. 
is now ranked as one of the 15 global financial centers in terms of competitiveness. Yet few in the West had even heard of it a few years ago. For as long as I've been with HSBC, it's been the leading international bank in China. We are steadily increasing our presence across the country as fast as regulations allow. We have outlets in 25 cities and over 102 branches. And for any company building out its way in, in China, it's vital to reach the Chinese consumers and the businesses of tomorrow. They are growing all the time. I'd now like to touch on India, one of tomorrow's biggest sources of human capital. Over the medium term, I think India is going to deliver even faster growth than China. Sure, you can see in the press this morning and last week, India has its problems with the Asian Games, but its fundamentals are also very strong. India is committed to improving its infrastructure. Earlier this year, I had the opportunity to meet the finance minister, and he has called on a doubling of infrastructure spending to one trillion for the year 2017. What's more, India's economy is already much less dependent on exports than China, and more dependent on domestic demand. Perhaps the biggest reason I am convinced that India will succeed, despite its constraints, is its people. Asia has taken education very seriously, and it's invested, and nowhere are the results more evident than in India. The country has a population of 1-2.2 billion, and unlike China, it is growing. India churns out a staggering 2.5 million graduates a year. Most of them are fluent in English, and today's Indian graduates will be tomorrow's global business leaders. The lessons we all need to understand is that you cannot run a global organization with a one-people strategy. You need to recognize that the challenges of attracting and retaining people in the markets like India are different to those of the West. And that in emerging markets, it is not the salary and the benefits, but the career development that is the number one driver which attracts people to jobs and keeps them there. And let's be clear, if companies like ours fail to harness this talent, there are now plenty of domestic and regional companies that will. Now let me take you to Latin America, a market at the heart of the South-South trade routes. Latin America used to be seen as the hotbed of instability. Certainly that was the case when in, in 1997, a former chairman in this room today asked me to go to Brazil. How things have changed in that decade. Our Brazilian bank is now one of the best performing of the group. Brazil has gone from basket case to bread basket. And there's now a wide group of other countries in the region, all on a sustainable growth path. Along with Brazil, I would add the economies like Argentina, Chile, Colombia, Peru, and Mexico. These nations are not going to return to the days of coups and kernels. They're going to grow with internal and international growth. But the lesson I really want to draw out of the, of the narrative on Latin America is the accelerating South-South story. All emerging regions are doing more business with each other and less dependent on the West. And it is in Latin America that I've really noticed the speed of change picking up. Brazil's trade surplus with China has tripled to around $15 billion in four years. Chile has seen a similar trend, supported by its copper reserves. Now direct investment is following the same pattern. China was the biggest foreign investor in Brazil in the first half of this year. And just recently, two Chinese state oil firms have offered $7 billion for a stake in a Brazilian energy startup company. One of the core reasons I moved to Hong Kong was to build the links between Asia and Latin America. And at HSBC, we are now seeing our business flows increasing between the two regions. We have relocated Chinese bankers to Brazil and moved Brazilian bankers to China, 
so we have the expertise in all the right places. At HSBC, we know that tomorrow's winners will be those who start to follow the South-South routes today. Continuing on this world tour, I'm moving now on to Turkey, tomorrow's bridge between Europe and the Middle East. Let me say a few words about the Middle East first. HSBC has been working in the region for more than a century, so we know the region better than most. It's also where I started my career in the early 70s. With all the attention the BRIC countries have been getting lately, I think the Middle East has been overlooked. But I believe all the ingredients and elements for success are still there. A growing population, an improving workforce, an international outlook, and of course, massive hydrocarbon reserves. And recovery is now underway in the Emirates. In fact, in a sign of confidence, Dubai has successfully gone back to the international markets last week to raise fresh funds. So all the evidence suggests that the Middle East will play an increasing role in the global economy. And I believe that deepening our ties with Turkey will be our key to unlocking the Middle East's potential. Turkey is a market that which has been very successful for HSBC recently. And every time I visit it, I'm struck by the country's growing influence across the wider region. In fact, I believe that Turkey has the potential to revolutionize Europe's relationship with the Middle East. And candidly, I'm perplexed by those who see Turkey as a threat to the European Union. With Turkey as a member, the EU would only be stronger. And now, more than ever, the EU cannot afford to pull up the drawbridge. Take the UK, for example. Almost half of our country, our exports, still end up in the rest of Europe. With, but with anemic growth there, where is the demand going to come from in the future? So I believe it is important for all our in interests to see that Turkey is at the heart of tomorrow's Europe. Next, I want to move on to Africa, tomorrow's emerging region. Africa is probably the least researched of any, any world markets, but that's the, one of the reasons why us, as brave investors, could find some of the best opportunities there. Africa is still 10 to 20 years as a, behind Asia as a consumer market. But there is an interesting dynamic right now. We have moved beyond the period where the West supported Africa through aid to one where the emerging markets are actively investing in the future of itself. Of course, you can take the um, Sarah Palin approach in Africa. It's not one country or even one homogeneous market. What marks out North Africa is its influence throughout the Middle East, through cultural links and the diaspora across the wider region. And at HSBC, we already have a strong presence in the markets of Egypt, which, are, which we are committed to building. But it's what's happening in sub-Sahara Africa that I'm most excited about. This is one emerging market where HSBC has been underrepresented up until now. So we've been looking closely at the opportunities there. You may have read that we have entered into exclusive discussions with Old Mutual about a majority stake in Nedbank of South Africa, South Africa's fourth largest bank. The deal isn't done yet, but it would be an exciting opportunity for HSBC. And candidly, this is the time to act, because you can see an increasing influence of China, Brazil, and India across the region, including the financial sector. Western-based companies are now catching on too, like Walmart, which has just offered more than $4 billion for one of South Africa's biggest retailers. Provided that all of this is matched by a commitment to social development, it could be a real change for the people of Africa. And I cannot imagine a world which we don't want to see that played out in our lifetimes. Indeed, as this highlights tomorrow's growth stories, it won't just be found in the BRIC countries, but in a whole new generation of emerging economies. And now I want to give you a, a new name today, and that's Civets. 
It's named after cat-like animals found in many parts of the emerging worlds. The civets are Colombia, Indonesia, Vietnam, Egypt, Turkey, and South Africa. These are young populations, dynamic, with improving uh, education, improving government, and being driven forward in a relatively political stable environment. In summary, the Deku will see the world divided into the Hicks and the Hogs. The heavily indebted industrial countries of the West will be relatively backwaters of growth. It's the higher opportunity, greater growth markets in the East and the South that will dominate the, hog, the Hogs and the Limelight. So where does HSBC go from here? Above all, if we need to take a long look, it's about competitiveness. First, it needs to reflect on asset values. On the, re on the recent Group CEO staff roadshow, I went to about 26 countries, and I only noticed two with positive interest rates. In other words, the destruction of money is worldwide. Only Brazil and Panama had positive money. Until that changes, until stimulus packages are taken away, we are creating false markets. It's only when these false markets are taken away that we will get a floor for asset values in the West. Second, we need to have a change in mindset. Western companies, particularly in the service sectors, need to think differently if they're going to make their skills indispensable in servicing the world's new trade flows. Not least, I believe they need to travel more and go and live in these markets as I did. As a nation, the UK also needs to invest in language learning. If we fail to do this, we will simply lose out as business startups bypass traditional Western hubs. Thirdly, we need to make it easier to do business in the centers like London and New York, not harder. The latest research shows that Hong Kong and Singapore are now joining London and New York as truly global financial centers. Above all, the West needs to make sure it doesn't regulate itself out of the financial services businesses. Let me explain. Perhaps one of the greatest lessons we've learned from the, the crisis was the need of governments and policymakers to work more closely together. Recent months have reminded us that achieving a common regulation between different jurisdictions will be extremely difficult, but not impossible. The agreement by the Basel Committee on Capital Requirements for Banks is a good example of what can be achieved when we put our minds in a collective way to it. But with such a wide range of different proposals for banking reform on the table, it's critical that policymakers continue to work together. From levies and taxes to the shape and structures of banks, unilateral policy responses can create obstacles to fair competition. And they ultimately hurt the consumer by reducing choice and increasing costs. And they can have the unintended consequences on the wider economy as well. Capital is mobile, it will go where it can, and it will be located in the most efficient manner. People are mobile too, and if firms move their activities, some economies could suffer real long-term damage. Take the debate on the size and structure of banks. It's a very important one, and I'm sure we will all recognize but the public and the political pressures surrounding this discussion in some parts of the West. But we need to make sure our policy decisions are based on empirical evidence and not simply on emotion. There was no common denominator or size or shape among the banks which failed in the West. Many were relatively small and the casualties were widespread. In the UK, the first run on a bank in 100 years happened at Northern Rock a small lender with a simple business model built around residential mortgage businesses. If any economy ends up with a, with a financial center where banks all look the same, then a crisis could more easily take out every institution in the marketplace. We could end up with more individual failings, not less. And all of this would have a disastrous impact on the economy. The financial system benefits from banks that are big enough to cope. 
Diverse business models can enhance return for shareholders. They can mitigate systemic risk, and as a result, I believe they aid financial stability. I believe HSBC's results throughout this crisis prove that we remain a profitable and diverse group who never needed to take any money from any taxpayer anywhere in the world. So what matters is not size, but risk. Our focus must be on making bankers safer, not smaller. Issues of bank structure are not best tackled by trying to legislate which banks can and which banks cannot be kept, but through capital requirements and enhanced supervision. In concluding, I'd like to say a few words about the UK. I am certain the City of London can continue to bring huge value to the process of economic development, not least in the emerging markets. But uncertainty is currently the biggest risk to the city's competitiveness. If the UK is to play its part fully, we need to ensure that with a new government in place, we de develop and adopt clear and consistent policy on regulation and the business environment. If, as some suggest, damage has been done to, the London, to London's perceived competitiveness since the crisis, this, needs not, this need not be irreversible. But equally, we must not ignore the signals, and the damage will only go further if we say nothing. Whether because of unilateral policy decisions or benign neglect, it is vital that all of us participate in the debate on the future of the City of London. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for listening to me. I'd now be delighted to take your questions. Thank you. Great. Th thank you very much, Mike. Uh, what we're going to do is, uh, Mike and I are going to sort of toss around a couple of these issues that he spoke about in his speech first, and then we will open it to the floor. I, uh, before we get on to the, the, the topic of financial regulation, which is where you ended, I'd just like to ask you about this question, which is the sort of the title, is the West falling behind? Um, I mean, there's at least another way of looking at what's happening and saying that actually what's happening is that the East and the South are catching up and it's almost inevitable that as more capital gets invested in places like China and India and Brazil, et cetera, that they will catch up. As their, as their people get better and better educated, it's not as though we can sort of take an old-style colonialist approach and keep them down. I mean, isn't it almost inevitable that they're catching up? Isn't that a better way of looking at things? Well, I think the first thing to say is China 100 years ago was the largest economy in the world. So catching up or retaining its, or returning to the position it had before is a mute um, debate. Obviously, the emerging markets, by their very nature, are volatile, and I would be the first to say that this is not going to be an upward growth without some disturbance. However, I do believe the approach that the emerging markets are taking to their growth in their own countries, be it by education, be it by free markets, be it by high savings rates, they're going to be at, a, at an advantage to the Western world. Education, by everybody's assessment, is deteriorating in the West. Savings are at a very low rate. Um, entrepreneurial approach is not always um, encouraged. Taxation is rising rather than reducing. So if you take your debate, and I'm not denying it, Hugo, yes, the West is above but the emerging markets are moving very fast. And I think if I'd sat here a decade ago and said to you that China would be the second largest economy in the world, you would have said impossible. What I think we're missing here is the speed of change. It is irreversible. And for the West to participate in the change, it needs to be part of the change. And I think rather than looking down on the emerging markets, I think you've got to look with the emerging markets. How is Great Britain, for example, going to play its role in that $1 trillion of infrastructure in India? Where are the great scientists? Where are the great engineers? Where are they going to be from the West participating in the growth of India and other parts? So, yes, you can say the West is on top, but so did Venice say that 
Yes, yes, yes. I mean, I, I, the point I was really making is it's almost, I mean, it's almost inevitable that they, that they will catch up. And it's a question of whether, I suppose, whether we can do things to keep moving ahead ourselves. I mean, it's, it's, not, it's not just a relative game. But, um, and I, I think I take your points that, I mean, education, savings, taxation, these are all big things. And the problem, of course, is when you have got um, so many legacy policies, I mean, it's very, very difficult to change. And because they're always losers. I mean, you say we've got too high taxation. I think probably a lot of people would agree that we do have too high taxation. But if you're, at the same time, you've got a high deficit and high debt levels, what are you going to do about it? And one of the things, of course, you can do is you can start cutting the public spending and, and welfare payments, and there is quite a lot of a move to do that. But then you, the problem is that you have the more vulnerable people in society. I mean, uh, actually, the people who are at the top of society in the West are still doing pretty well, but it's, as you've seen, in not only here, but in, 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 in continental Europe and in America in particular, I mean, actually, it's, it's the, the people at the bottom of society who really haven't moved forward at all in the last decade in terms of their economic position. Well, first of all, I'm not talking about the UK. I'm talking about the West, so just to be clear when the remarks are made. And I think you've got a very good point. I was in Washington recently talking to a first-time congressman um, who was actually elected to West Virginia, normally a very Republican state. And he was telling me about a constituent of his who earned at the height of his earning capacity $40 an hour. He had lost his job twice. He retrained. He was now earning $9 an hour. Let's put that in perspective before tax. This is America. This is what the subprime market is all about in America. And of course, that difference between the $40 an hour and the $9 an hour had been bridged by subprime borrowings. Today, there are no subprime borrowings. So he's had to adjust his lifestyle. And I would say going through America at the moment is a very significant change. It's not all negative. Chrysler are hiring um, peak workers at $11 an hour. And it will take time, but America will produce goods again that will be sold in America at prices that Asia won't be able to compete. So it's not all one way. Mm. I mean, when I started my career living in the Middle East in 1973, you couldn't see anything but American cars, Westinghouse air conditioners, fridges. I'm not saying that's going to come back in totality, but America will re-engineer itself with a lower cost base, and that will give the engine of growth that America is known for. And America needs to have growth. And I don't think we should just look at this emerging market as a pure growth at, to the disadvantage of the West. It's a, a growth that is embraced by the West. If there's anything we look at, we look at Africa and say to ourselves, how was it in our lifetime did we allow Africa to be so far behind the rest of the world? Mm. And is that acceptable from the statements you make about adjustments? Is that acceptable for the next generation? I don't think it is. I think the world is coming together because communication is bringing us together, and the standards of living have to come more in line across the world. Okay, well, I think that there is some evidence of that happening. But can I now come on to this question of financial regulation? And you said we shouldn't have unilateral approaches. You also said, I think, several times, capital is mobile. And um, obviously, the context in which we're sitting here today is that the UK's Independent Banking Commission has started its work. I think it was about a week ago they came up with their sort of first list of issues. One of the ideas on the table would indeed to be to break up banks like HSBC and Barclays and Royal Bank of Scotland into so-called utilities and casino banks. Um, putting all that together, the, you're essentially um, dropping quite a heavy hint. Capital is mobile. If a unilateral approach is taken by the UK, HSB will just up sticks and go off somewhere else. How realistic is that threat? Well, firstly, I think you made the threat, not me. I have actually said that capital is mobile. It's mobile into emerging know, it markets. A, it's, it's mobile out of emerging markets, out of the developed world. And it, was, the world. it was an iron fist in a, in a kid yeah, glove. Yeah. But, I mean, but I mean, firstly... I mean, how, but just, I mean, how easy would it actually be for HSBC, to say, to move its, its HQ and its domicile to... Hong Kong. It's a hypothetical question. Yeah, but having to answer it hypothetically. Ha or having said that, we've done it once from Hong Kong to London, so it, we know how to do it. 
Um, <laughs> but let me be much more to the point in regard to banking. Diversification is the fundamental manager of all risks, be it a domestic bank or an international bank. The fact is that we've got none of our businesses dominate. In 1997, it was our personal financial services business that dominated in, inside the group's results. In 98, it was our commercial banking business. In 1999, it's been our global banking markets of business. At one stage, it was Europe. The other stage dominate was Asia. You've got to have diversity of risk. We are the world's leading international bank. We are the number one brand in financial services. We are based in London, the number one center for international business. I would like to think that will all continue. But you have to understand that these plates move very carefully. And London as a city and the UK as a country at the center of international business needs to understand what's happening in the world and want companies the size of HSBC to be located here. So, but does that mean that if push came to shove, you would actually move? Do you think that, H obviously, you won't be there to probably to take the decision, but would, does that mean that, do you think HSBC would actually move again to Hong Kong? Because there are some people who say the reason you left Hong Kong for London was because you didn't like to be too close to the emerging Chinese dragon and that actually part of the attraction of being in, in, in London is the rule of law is more established, that you're, you know, it's, it's a relatively small country, HSBC is, is a big organization, whereas if, if you were really fully based in Hong Kong, you'd be potentially much more susceptible to political pressure from Beijing. Well, we've been in Hong Kong and Shanghai since 1865. We've never left China ever through the good times and the bad times. So maybe some of the judgments you're making on why we moved to the UK may be slightly flawed in that argument. I would say that we are very happy to be here in the UK. As you rightly point out, I'm retiring at the end of the year. So the decision wouldn't be mine if it was to be a decision. As I said, it's a hypothetical question. So I believe what we need to do as HSBC is part of the banking fraternity and a part of the industry worldwide is to explain why banks big enough to cope are needed in the world economy. What worries me most of all of this is will world trade suffer? Will everybody become much more country significant, regionally significant, trapping savings in certain areas? If all the savings are kept in the east, how will the west pay its debts? I think this is something that's missed in all these things. We want an open world economy. It's kept us away from war and famine for a long period of time. And I think the UK and London in particular has a real need to be robust to support the argument of international banking and international trade. Okay, and just one final point on that before we throw up uh, uh, to, to the floor. Uh, when you talk about this unilateral danger of regulation, apart from what the UK Banking Commission is doing, is there anything else on your horizon that worries you specifically that could be done unilaterally? Well, I mean, every country has the right to manage its affairs as it so wishes. So unilateral versus country-specific requirements is fully understood. I think the, one of the biggest challenges facing the world is where Europe sits within the world and how is it going to operate. Clearly, some of the Basel um, recommendations, which are soon going to be regulation, will have an impact on European banking. And it's not a good impact if it's going to contract European banking just at a time when Europe needs support to grow out of the issues it's got from overspending in the past decade or so.